Now to join Judith Chalmers for the home service. Welcome to Television's Designer Programme. In the home service today, we'll be meeting two men very much involved with design in the home. Sir Terence Conran, uncrowned king of the high street. And Bill Bonetti. I'll be reporting on what happened when we asked him, as a top designer, to remodel the front room of a former council house. And talking of council homes, we'll be talking about complaints that you've raised with us about the problems of defective council houses. Problems that now affect no less than 30,000 owners, who obviously thought the properties were fine when they bought them, but now face either hefty repairs or even wholesale demolition. Stephen Gold, our resident solicitor, has been looking into that for us and will give us his advice. Now, if you watch our programme regularly, you can't fail to know about Andy's Flying Ducks. I mean, you asked where they originated from, didn't you? And I'm very, very pleased to say at last we do have an answer, and we reckon we have the oldest flying ducks in this country. I'll be telling you more about that later on. <laughs> I can't <laughs> wait to hear. Can you, Stephen? Anyway, now, some three months ago, we asked interior designer Bill Binetti to help the Turrell family of Birmingham because they wanted to transform their front room. It was a challenge for all concerned. Bill Binetti is used to budgets of thousands of pounds, but Ray and Sue Turrell had only a few hundred pounds to spend. This is Andy's report. Last year, Ray and Sue Turrell became one of the new generation of homeowners when they bought their 1920s council house. They'd lived on this estate in Birmingham for something like 10 years, but actually buying their house has given them a different perspective on the bricks and mortar. Like most of us, they're on a tight budget, and original ideas aren't very easy to come by. Well, obviously, I wanted to be right for them. I wanted to work for them. But at the same time, I wanted to be a, a, a strong design statement. I don't want a monument to myself. I don't believe that that's the way people should design. But I think it's got to reflect a lifestyle of today. And really, I, I want the room to be really comfortable and functional and, and, and good to look at. As you can see from the, the room itself, it's, we are very, very limited for space. It's just one main front room. Right, so this is the main heart of the living. That's right. goes on here. Everything goes on here. Sure, so if you have family or friends to, to suffer, mm -hmm. uh, this is the room, this you, is use. The room you, yeah. you use. I see you've got a very interesting collection of objects, ranging mm -hmm. from uh, 30s radios, clocks and the like right through to very delicate and fine china. It's, it's a very diverse collection. Um, it's something we've always uh, been interested in, it, ever since I was about 15 years old. We've always liked older things. Is the radio your collection and the china your collection? Um, so? Well, I used to hate the radios and, and things like that, but uh, then I realised that if you, you could polish them up a bit and make them look nice, the china's mine. I like, I like china, and Ray likes china as well. Ray, I noticed that you're a blacksmith. That's right, yes, I've been a blacksmith since I was about 17. Right, wonderful. So you you obviously like working with metal. Of course, yeah. Did yeah. you make the gate that I came through? That's right. Mm. So that's very nice. It's beautifully mm. done. And obviously, keeping the prices down means we have to do it ourselves. Mm. Yeah, I think that would be important. So how, how is your tatting, Sue? Can you say? Oh, um, with a big needle, yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, I'm not, I can do a bit of sewing. And right, so I, mean, I was thinking of curtains. I mean, mm. they're quite simple to, to make up. The initial reaction when I looked at it was one of, oh my God, how do I cope with this? But in fact, there's good elements about it. A lot of us don't have a lot of money. <laughs> and I, I, I think one has to take advantage of what skills exist. Sue, for example, is able to sew. Uh, Ray is this wonderful metal uh, worker, this blacksmith, and really loves his work. At the end of the day, they're no different to any other client of mine in a sense that they have a list of requirements and uh, things they want 
to use and things they've collected and want to incorporate into the job. Um, the advantage in this case is that most of my clients wouldn't dream of doing it themselves, whereas Sue and Ray uh, are very able and willing and keen to do things themselves. You're obviously thinking of incorpor incorporating uh, a fair bit of metalwork into the design. I would like to, yes, because uh, I like metal anyway. Mm. And the fact that, that you work in metal, I think we should take advantage of that. Certainly. I don't know quite what we're going to do with it, but I'd like to sort of measure it out and then think about it, and I'll come back to you with some plans and ideas. That's fine. Um, but it's very important that I get your input, because really it's your room. And I can take your ideas and hopefully transform them into a practical scheme. Good, I'm glad to see you got rid of the brickwork quite well. You've lined out the back very well. That's right, the the, we've got for the electrics in the back there. Of sure. Course. That is a template of one of the rods, is it, the uprights? Mm -hmm. um, no real problems, actually. But, um, the, um, the only problem was the, the, the height of the ceiling. It's, it differs as you go along. Uh, oh, yes, of course it will. One yes. section mm. to another section. There's about uh, three quarters of an inch difference. So oh, each good, one... and you picked two up to measure each one. That's right. Has to oh, be that's very good. Yes, I should have yeah. pointed that out. The actual curtains, because I want to suggest we have the walls the same colour as the curtains, I think should be a, a very nice neutral colour, but a good warm colour. Mm -hmm. Oh, the walls are going to be done in the, that colour. In that colour, mm -hmm. but we'll over-sponge it in warmer colours. Yeah. I've broken a sponge up already, so that it's an uneven surface. You wet the sponge with a little paint, and then we hope it works. So we take it very lightly, and we just touch the wall with it. See those little marks? Where it's a bit blotchy like that, we'll come back. It's a bit wet, the sponge, at the mm -hmm. moment. Very gently going over the whole of it, right? I can't admit the effect is quite startling, really. It's to surprise It's startling, though. you're right. I'm startled um. myself. <laughs> but in fact, the idea is so to have an overall blotchy effect. Box here. Well, you just yank it out and no problem. What do you think of that effect, Ray? Uh, the effect's good, but I think possibly it's a bit too harsh. Mm. But don't worry about it being dark because we'll overdo it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can over sponge. This is the whole joy of this yeah. finish is that you can go on sponging as much as you like. Do you have to do the ceiling as well? Oh yes, oh, oh yes, yeah. all surfaces. <laughs> you can do the ceiling. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> we all do the ceiling. <laughs> The, the little two-seater sofa that you've mm. got at the moment, we won't keep. Yeah. Uh, because whilst there's nothing actually wrong with it, uh, it's a small thing, it only seats two, and as I mentioned, there are some very good sofas on the market that actually convert into a double bed. Yeah. But I, I should think it's a f not every night anyway, it's an occasional thing. Yeah. Um, but the big thing about it, it gives you more comfortable seating. A very useful thing, I think, when dealing with a small space, is to give things two functions and to utilize uh, any little bit of space that you have. For example, the television is concealed in a cupboard, which keeps it out the way when it's not in use and it's fitted onto a very easily operatable bracket. Same as the sofa, uh, which whilst it's a very elegant, comfortable sofa, does double up as a sofa bed, which is ideal for an occasional guest as a put you up. Compared to the way we had them before, you know, it, it's marvellous now, the space and the way they're laid out, it, it's lovely. When we have a large collection of radios and chai, which we can alternate occasionally, um, and it's with the light and it's stunning, it really is. We can't get over it, can we? No, it doesn't, you know. Very amazing. Well, one thing is for sure, the clients are exceptionally happy. But what were they like to work with? Oh, uh, they were charming, absolutely charming. Uh, and very positive. I mean, there were quite a few things they didn't like and suggestions that were made during the, the, the design. And Ray in particular was very sort of precise about the tone of the sponging and how much to put on and he would say, no, that's far too bright, take it down or take it up a bit. And, um, he was very positive altogether and extremely keen the, the, the way both Sue and Ray tackled the various jobs which they're not used to doing. They, they, they didn't like Sue said, she doesn't make curtains professionally. 
and yet she tackled them superbly. I think she's done a great job of the curtains. They, they, they look fabulous. I mean, I, I knew what I had to work with. I saw all their objects and pictures and bits and pieces, the chairs, etc., the carpet, all the things that we kept. And as the scheme developed, I sort of got quite a clear picture of how it would look. I'm very pleased with the end result. I think, I think it shows their possessions off to good advantage. It, it's unbelievable, it really is. I mean, we, I know we've worked hard, but even uh, up until this morning, we couldn't believe it the way it was. It was it's absolutely amazing, really. It's only, only over the last three or four days that it's all started to come together and it's all started to look as it should have done before that. It's absolute chaos. <laughs> it's just work. Has any of, uh, any of the neighbours at all seen it yet? Well, no, one neighbour, yes. <laughs> what was the reaction when they saw it? She thought it was beautiful. She couldn't get over it when she walked through the door. You know. It's got to be one of the classiest rooms in the area, hasn't it? <laughs> it certainly has, no, it? I, I've got to say this. I didn't realise that Ray could do all the things he has done. You know, um, I didn't realise it myself, to be quite honest. Worked so hard and done so many things that I don't think he even thought was possible, you know. Well, that must be a great incentive for a lot of people watching this. It certainly is, yeah. I think anyone, uh, if they put their heart into it, that anyone can do it. It's not really that difficult. A delighted Mr and Mrs Turrell. And if you're interested in the details of that transformation, they are being included from now on in the Home Service A to Z booklet. And the address for that at the end of the programme. Without a doubt, the Turrells have added to the value of the council house they bought last year. But buying a council house hasn't been a bed of roses for everyone. The problem occurs in what are called PRC houses, prefabricated reinforced concrete houses. They were mainly built before the 60s using concrete reinforced with metal rods. Cracking of the concrete and corrosion of the metal can make the houses unsafe, although not all of them are in that kind of condition. The Department of the Environment estimates there are nearly 200,000 PRC homes in this country. But many thousands of people bought their council homes unaware of this problem. So to help them, the government passed the Housing Defects Act of 1984. Under this law, owners of defective homes are entitled to have them repaired, with the local authority paying for 90% of the cost. In certain cases, the local authority could buy back the house at 95% of its value. Well, all should have been fine. But we've been hearing from you that, in practice, things have worked out very differently. Take the case of Mrs Anne Jones, who lives at Epping Green in Essex. She bought her council house on this small estate in 1980. They are what's called airy-type houses, and the government says they are defective by design. They can, however, be repaired, but Mrs Jones' local council is now thinking of knocking them all down to build a bigger estate. She told us, Lots of the residents have lived here for 40 years. We don't want to see our community ripped apart. What can we do? And we heard from Gail Rogers from Bidolf in Stoke-on-Trent. Well, Gail lives on an estate which belonged to the National Coal Board. Although the houses look fine, they were labelled defective in the 1984 Act. Unfortunately, no one realised and the NCB continued to sell them off to tenants. The Housing Defects Act doesn't apply to people who've bought their houses after the cut-off date of April 1984. So a campaign has been started to help those trapped in houses they can't see.